Hey, you're listening to the James Altucher Show on YouTube. You're going to hear directly from peak performers who have defeated all odds and decided that the only way to truly be successful in a world out of balance is to choose yourself. I upload a new video every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So subscribe to my channel and click on the bell notification now so you don't miss a thing. So pleased to have super hedge fund manager, investor, philanthropist, Roy Niederhofer on the podcast. Roy, how's it going? Very well, James. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's been a long time we've known each other, and uh, it's great to be, uh, be here with you. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I'll just mention for the podcast listeners, I think it was like 16 years ago, I worked for your brother, Victor, for his hedge fund business. And of course, 10 years before that, you worked for Victor, right. <laughs> your brother. So of course, you went on to become a, a much bigger success. You started your own hedge fund out of that generation. I think out of the, my generation that worked for Victor, none of us started hedge funds. But you had you started a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, Monroe Trout, Toby Crable. You know, it was, it was different generations. It was certainly a different time. I, I, I remember when I started, it was in a one-bedroom apartment on 7th Avenue, and I had seven computers around the perimeter of my living room. And someone walked in from a pension fund and allocated money to me when I was still in a one-bedroom apartment. And I think to myself, it's just unheard of, unfathomable today that with the small amount of capital, of working capital that I had to start the business and that I could get off to such a fast start. And I think some of that's regulation. Some of that's just the times have changed. I think, I think a lot of it, you're right, maybe some of it's regulation. But I, and just, just to mention, um, we'll talk about investing and hedge funds. And, and I want to mention your, your uh, you know, the, uh, the chairman of the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, New York City Opera, right. Yeah, and you're uh, also an accomplished violinist, musician yourself. And we'll be talking about a lot of things, in particular how one achieves excellence in any area. But I do want to focus on some aspects of, of hedge funds and, and so on. I think times have changed in the sense that, and maybe you tell me if you agree, hedge funds have become more institutionalized. It's not like the wild west. People used to think, oh, if I want great returns, like 1,000% returns, I'll go to some kid who's got computers in his room and invest with him instead of an institution. But now hedge funds are institutions. I think that's definitely true. I, I think our little piece of the business, which was the futures industry, because it really came out of Chicago and really it was a bunch of farmers at the beginning in the 70s who found that there were these long-term trends in markets and developed very simple strategies to capture them. And then that turned into a more eventually somewhat institutionalized version in the 80s with Paul Jones and Monroe and some others that came out of uh, my brother's shop and my brother as well. But I think the idea was we were doing something that was really negatively correlated or at least zero correlated with equities. Hedge funds, even today, are essentially a, say, a 0.4 beta bet on the equity markets with some short ball built in and you can easily model their returns that way. So, so um, I want to, I want to back out of the weeds a second. You say 0.4 beta with the market. So I'm saying you're saying hedge funds are basically correlated with the market more than they used to. It used to be if the markets could, went down, maybe hedge funds would go up. And if the markets went up, maybe hedge funds would go up more now, basically. And I've noticed this for the past decade. If, if the markets go up, hedge funds go up. If the markets go down, hedge funds go down. It, just like venture capitalists, just like private equity firms, like almost, and just like stocks, there's not really diversification in stocks anymore. Like if Exxon goes up, Microsoft goes up. This diversification seems over. It, it's really tough to find things that won't perform in the same way as a stock market. And there's this been, been this big risk on trade for the last 10 years with a lot of liquidity floating into the market from QE and from QE, from, from, from sorry, from quantitative easing, the essentially the creation of liquidity by the Federal Reserve to prop up financial markets. And it worked. So it's been easy to make money being long. But that was really true for the previous 10 or 20 years as well. It was only before that in the 90s and in the 80s before that, that truly uncorrelated hedge funds were able to succeed and, and do as well as they did. And yet you're succeeding. And by succeeding, I mean, you're producing good, positive returns with very little, I'm going to call it risk, but there's te more technical terms for it. Like you, you don't have, your returns don't have as much volatility as the market's returns. Let me put it that way. And, but I want to reel it back a little further. You're obviously 
incredibly smart. Uh, like I said, you're a, an accomplished musician. I, I heard you say on one interview, you could hear a song and then play it on the piano. You perform the violin practically professionally just as a hobby. And you know, you went to Harvard, you started this super successful hedge fund. You, you're, you, but you come from, let's call it humble beginnings. Your dad was a, a cop for 21 right. years. How'd you, how'd you get started as a super investor? Well, my, uh, I, I was very interested in computers when I was young. I, I, at about age 13, I fell in love with the game Space Invaders, and I decided I was going to try to write a version of that for the computer that I, I had, which is called the TRS-80. And this is in about 1979. And that turned into, within the next couple of years, a business that employed about 30 people and put me and my high school partners through college uh, with the money so, that we made. So, 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 by the way, I like Space Invaders and had a TRS-80, but I didn't write a program and start a company at the age of 13 to make other versions of Space Invaders. Like what, what was driving you? Like what, what got you going? I loved. Did you get along with your dad? Yeah. And yeah. He was supportive. Although, well, he was supportive of me, except he really, really wanted me outside playing tennis and he didn't quite get the potential that computers had back then. This is you know, in, in the early 80s. He died in 81. So it was right before things really picked up in the computer world. But I think uh, he, by the very end of his life, recognized that I was really good at it, at least for then. And uh, it then took off from there. So you were you were 15 uh, when he passed away, I yeah, guess. 14, I guess. And, and you were in high school. You were doing this business. And obviously, he was a big influence on your life. Uh, uh, how did you, you know, a lot of kids, when bad things happen, kind of veer off course. And it seems like that you got motivated to keep to go even further. Like what what happened around the time, you know, this this event happened? Well, it was uh, certainly a very tough period of my life. I, I didn't have a big social group. And I I guess I found that I was good enough and I was satisfying my intellectual needs, just programming and school wasn't so hard for me. I, and so I was able to spend a lot of time doing something I really liked, which was coding back in, at a time when it, you know, it was a different kind of coding. There were very specific challenges. I, one, of the, one of the proudest accomplishments of my life was writing a graphical version of baseball in 2000 characters, not 2000 K or 2000 megabytes, but right. 2000 bites and and so, that, that was kind of the same problem like someone like a bill gates confronted when he was writing exactly. a basic compiler uh is you had to fit it small enough to fit into the altair at the time exactly right they had 4k on that i guess and that but so i was a, a few years past a, after they were after gates and allen so i didn't really have you know and i don't think i was as technically good as those guys were they were incredible for the times but i was good at marketing and i was good at having a business as well as coding. So I guess that was uh, an unusual combination of, be, of having some technical skill and being able to, in that case, market it and produce some programs that people wanted. And maybe later on that was being more of a generalist that was helpful for me rather than being the best coder or the best discretionary trader. But how at 13 or 14 or 15 did you turn this into a little business and you know, now kind of a software business that's selling games all over the place could sell for tens of millions. Like back then things were different. You had to be mega profitable and, and have adults there. Now it's different, but what, what got you into doing this as a business as opposed to just a, an obsessive hobby? Well, I, I guess I always had this idea that maybe the games that we were writing might have a broader audience than just the people that I knew. So Back then, for a couple hundred dollars, you can have an ad in a computer magazine, and we started doing that, and we started getting orders, and we'd sit there and uh, burn these cassette tapes. That's how we distributed them, and we, uh, we, we, we I remember the, the MasterCard rep came in, and we wanted to take MasterCard. It's called Master Charge back then, and he walks in, and he says, so I'm here to see Roy Niederhofer and Evan Grossman, he's my partner, and... He said, well, I'm Roy and this is Evan. He said, no, 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 I mean, you're your father. And he just couldn't understand that this was a, two kids. We were 14 at the time when we started that. And, but they gave it to us and we had the clicker, the, uh, the old the imprinter and 
we were able to take credit cards and it was kind of off to the races. And well, then, uh, and you made deals with like Sears and well, then, then something very interesting happened. We got a call from a guy who was in the record business, a rather prominent record producer. And he said, you know, I have this idea that I could make some money distributing computer games. So how many games can you write in one year? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15. He said, well, what about hundreds? And I said, well, I guess, I guess we could try, but they'd have to be pretty similar to each other. We certainly can't write hundreds of original titles. So we started to write hundreds of what would be called now casual games. A lot of them were pretty similar. You know, we take a, a space game and we change the background from black to blue and then suddenly it'd be in a river and then we change it to, uh, you know, gray and it'd be in a race course. But that's and, just like Pac-Man versus Ms. Pac-Man. Yeah. Essentially. But there, again, it was much simpler and we were, we were literally buying computers for people that we thought were smart and saying, here, learn to program and write games for us. And interestingly, two of those guys are now some of the biggest, uh, sorry, one of the, the two brothers that we got uh, the computers for ended up selling a huge public company. They were the first to do uh, ticketing at the movie theater, the tele-ticket that, that, uh, that you could get. It's called Radiant Systems. So they sold that, and then they have another company that is uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, multi multiplayer online uh, games. So What's the game? I, I don't remember the name of it, but it's uh, Erez Gorin, this guy's name. And so, so when you say you turned it into a business, you, you started selling them through these ads, through some stores, through this record producer. How did he distribute them? Well, he had, because of his record distribution deals, placement agreements at Sam Goody and different uh, record stores back then. And so I walked into Sam Goody and there was a rack of my games sitting there and uh you know, I was 16 years old. How'd you do the packaging? Like, how did you know all these aspects? Well, he handled some of that. We would just we would just do the actual game, and they hired a airbrush a airbrush artist, like one of these guys you see in Times Square. And you know, back then it was uh, you know airbrushed planets and airbrushed frogs and airbrushed airplanes. And so, you know. so <laughs> what kind of money? Like, what kind of money were you making at this age? And you had some. You got some of your high school friends to invest and. In Right. So to, to have some working capital, we sold shares to our teachers for uh, 20 venture shares for twenty five dollars each. And uh, I think we probably raised two thousand dollars to start the business. And the business was in the mid six figures, which was a lot of money for a bunch of 16 year olds. Mid and, six figures. Yeah. So, man, man, I would have ruled the school <laughs> if I was making more than like forty dollars a week. And I mean, paper out. <laughs> I guess I was a bit of a baller back then. But, you know, I had, you know, a hundred dollars. I thought I was, you know. Big time. <laughs> that you, you had more than a hundred dollars. You sit mid six figures. You were making like what? Well, I, you know, there were four of us, so we split it, and then we we paid, that was our revenues. But you know, we all essentially put ourselves through college. One guy bought a fancy sports car, and, and you went to Harvard. So you put yourself through Harvard on this. You didn't have to take out like a scholarship or loans or anything like that. How do you think kids today can get encouraged? I mean, it seems like like just like with hedge funds, you were sort of at the beginning of the wild west with computers. Nobody. I mean, it was only 10 years later, people were every day starting internet companies. Right. There's very, there very few kind of computer game companies back then. There was like Atari and a few others, and then yours. And uh, it seems like, A, you're really good at kind of finding that Wild West spots. Like, you know, in the early 90s, I can't think of that many hedge funds other than Soros and a handful of others and, and your brothers, for instance. But, um, but more importantly, what, how would you encourage parents or kids to think about entrepreneurship right now? I think entrepreneurship is much more accessible now. I think the idea of starting your own website, having monetizing yourself on Instagram, um, coding and developing an app. I mean, I think this is it's a lot more uh, part of the zeitgeist these days. So I think what it really takes is, is creativity and the diligence to implement it in an interesting way and then to be able to get it out there in marketing. I think today is much more, it's much more of a problem than it was back then because there's so much competition. Back then, if you had, you know, there, there was maybe one or two programs in a particular category, now you probably have 100 pieces of comp 100 competitors in every app type that you're going to write. So the flip side is there's world. more distribution channels than ever. Sure. Sure. So, so like if like, like right now, how with your kids, how do you instill and particularly, you know, you've been a successful hedge fund manager. How do you instill in your kids the, the value of, of money 
the value of like maybe entrepreneurship. Do you think pe people in general are cut out to be entrepreneurs? Like, can anyone be an entrepreneur? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on this? I, I think what makes successful entrepreneurs is that is, is not so much that they're exceptionally good at one thing, but they're pretty good at a lot of things. So if I look back and, you know, again, it's very easy for me to look back and say, well, you know, I've had some success. So what I have to say on this is interesting, but there's a lot of retrospective bias and there are a lot of people writing computer games in 1981 that are not successful today. And so I don't want to sound too, I don't want to be com uh, completely uh, uh, sure of my credibility here. But what I would say is that Having, I guess, what Scott Adams, the uh, Dilbert columnist, called I was it, just going to say the talent stack. The talent stack. stack. And you know, when I look back, I was a pretty good coder, and I was, I got lucky. There's definitely some luck to have this interesting distribution deal. But I was able to produce a lot of product because I was able to motivate a lot of people to join me in this. And we had some interesting ideas, like it would be okay to buy a smart kid a computer and expect that he, within three months he'd be able to produce a product for us which was a bit of a gamble. So I think being a risk taker has been very helpful. Being able to communicate well, having good marketing materials, and now, of course, there's plenty of ways to do that, but having writing ability, speaking ability, enough so to get your ideas across. Those have all been very helpful for me over the course of time. So it's not just being great at one thing, but I think being you know, 80th to 90th percentile at a bunch of different important qualities. So, so like uh, risk taking, communicating, communication skills, obviously you had technical skills, probably had some sales and negotiation skills. How would you get, and I know, we're, I, I know this is focusing on your ages 13 to 15, there's a <laughs> lot more to talk about, but how did you get people motivated at that age to, you know, do things for you? Well, I, money didn't hurt, you know, a few hundred dollars to a, a kid making probably 75 cents an hour mowing lawns was a pretty serious amount of money and buying a computer for a kid yeah or yeah so so we had a pretty good uh set of offers that we were making to people who wanted to work for us but it was more than that we had people typing contracts and it was uh it was quite an operation and i guess with the with the record producer because again this was a wild west area just like you were saying earlier somebody some institution would go into your studio and just throw money at you to invest people weren't looking for the standard credentials to support a good idea. Right now, if someone was going to invest in the hedge fund, they want to see the degrees. They want to see someone with a PhD in risk management. They want to see, you know, all the uh, Fifth Avenue office. You know, you kind of want to find those areas where they're not crowded yet. That's right. But, you know, I, I will say also that when I started my, my futures fund, in 93, I'd already had five years of trading experience. I could show that I'd written code and that demonstrate it, that ran the whole operation. We had real-time P&L in really from 1987 onward, which was fairly unusual for the day. It was a strategy that we could quantitatively present and show that it was going to be negatively correlated to everything else, which was very advantageous because it would lower people's risk in their portfolios. So I was able to communicate that to people. So it wasn't just that it was taking a, a, a gander on somebody completely unknown. I did have some pedigree I had in my computing background. So again, being prepared, overnight successes are rarely that. And I think having some background in a lot of these relevant areas did help. It seems like when you graduated college, you could have gone in any number of areas. You could have gone into computers. Maybe, you, I don't know if this was a choice, you could have gone into music or something related to that. Obviously, your brother was a hedge fund manager. You could work with him. Why did you decide ultimately to go work with family and, and go into the investing business? Well, I was pretty sure I was going to take a different path. I, I got very interested in the brain and neuroscience in college. I didn't want to be a programmer, and I thought that the real frontier of science was what's happening inside the brain. What's, how did 10 to the 11th undifferentiated neurons produce consciousness and visual recognition and all the interesting things that brains do. And then I got interested in a question that seemed very close to my experience. Um, I got to tell a little story. At, at yeah, this, as, with, as with many things, there was a beautiful woman involved in, in this particular decision that I made. Um, there was a girl that lived across the hall from me who I ended up on a date with. And she was very beautiful. And she sat there next to me at a concert of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And I turned to her and I said, 
you know, have you heard this before live? And she said, well, I don't think I've heard it at all. And that just stuck with me. What was her experience hearing you know, maybe the greatest piece of music ever written for the first time live in Symphony Hall? And I ended up doing my thesis on that. What is the effect of musical training on the electrical activity in your brain? So I was all set to do that for a career. Like an academic. An academic. I, I applied to Cambridge. I got in. I was going to make a, a, I was very interested by that point in uh, brain, uh, direct uh, brain control of outside devices. So I was going to try to start with the demo project of a musical instrument that you can control with the, with the brain directly. And I was all set and got admitted to Cambridge, but I, they didn't fund me. So there I was thinking, oh boy, do I want to go into debt because of this? And my brother essentially made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Come and work, be a trader. It's June of 87. It's, everyone's making money being long stocks. What a fantastic time. It's, you know, it's inch, I love New York. So he uh, essentially convinced me to change paths. It's so interesting because that idea of controlling music instruments with your brain, like let's say different areas light up in your brain so that controls different keys on the piano or on violin or whatever. Not that exact idea, but that type of idea is only just now um, coming into effect with like disabled people mm -hmm. and, you know, using it to control, you know, uh, legs. Yes, artificially. It, it would have been a fantastic application. And I, I guess if I'd continued, I would have been early and hopefully successful there. But I, uh, I guess finance was uh, was my calling after, so, after so, all that. So so your brother, I mean, your brother is like, what is he, 25 years older than At you? 22, yeah. So so did you have a relationship with him growing up or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a very powerful, eccentric, wonderful, thoughtful, uh, off the wall influence on me. And, and, he, and everyone who knows my brother, he, he's such an unusual guy. I, but, I will, I will <laughs> say he is such an unusual right? guy. You, you know. <laughs> and, and just to mention, not only an unusual investor, but he was five times U.S. Uh, single squash champion. Right. So, so just like you, he had mo uh, a, a very big talent stack. He's a little bit more eccentric, I would say. Well, you know, I, 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 I can talk to my wife about that and see who's more eccentric. But the, uh, I, 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 he certainly had, there were big shoes to fill. And, you know, to have a world champion athlete, and he was also the most successful financial guy that I'd ever met in my life. And, you know, it was, I was in awe of him. And he, uh, and he was incredibly generous, not just to me, to so many people, some of whom you mentioned earlier, in teaching and being a mentor. And by example, I think the greatest uh, thing that he taught us all, and maybe you'll concur with this, is to really think differently, to not be afraid of thinking in an anti-consensus way, that being different was itself a virtue. Uh, let me respond to that, because I think, yes, he was, and you've used the word contrarian a lot in your interviews, he was like an extreme contrarian. He always, would encourage people to think skeptically about his ideas, their ideas. He would open, he was very, very interested in skepticism. He was very interested, if you're gonna be a skeptic, test everything. Right. Testing everything was very important to him. Um, and then I'll think of other things as we as we go along, I'm sure. <laughs> so, so, okay, so, he, and by contrarian, if stocks were going up, it surprises me that he uses that to convince you to come on board because I'm sure he didn't feel they were going to go up forever, or maybe he did. Well, he uh, he's always been quite quite the the equity bull. Uh -huh. And in '87, remember, this is after my whole childhood had been spent watching stocks do nothing. And I remember when I made some money from my computer company, thought, why would I invest in the stock market in 1981? It had done nothing for eight years, and after inflation, it was a disaster. So I found these high yield bonds that were yielding 11 or 12 percent. So that's what I invested in. But then not a bad investment, even right, up to they this worked day out okay. But but you know, the for the next six years, stocks had just gone straight up, and there was this great new story. The taxes were low, and and there, there was also a lot to do in other markets. And and he was able to really capitalize on that. But of course, on October 1987, which is like my third week of trading, things changed. And I watched the most successful guy I'd ever met literally go bankrupt from nine o'clock in the morning to three o'clock and then have the best day of his career from three o'clock to four thirty. So, when, when so, the, let, so let's address that because sure. at if that had happened to me by three o'clock, you're saying he went 
the most successful financial guy went broke by three in the afternoon, uh, kind of unexpectedly. Like people were anticipating this over the weekend, but they didn't know. And then Monday was just collapse. And then, uh, uh, you know, it's called Black Monday. And uh, I think by three o'clock, I would be so devastated. I would be so afraid. I would sell everything, get out, and then only then watch everything go up and participate in none of it. So what's the psychology to be able to handle that kind of pain? Because you must have been in that kind of pain too. Like what was going on psychologically well, that day? It certainly, it certainly is a day that I will never forget. And it, it seared into my mind the idea that emotion and psychology can trump fundamentals in, in, a, in, a, in an unbelievable way until you actually see it happen. So for contrarian reasons, my brother had bought stocks and bonds that morning. And what was very interesting about the, the, the chart that day was that the stock market actually was above its opening price at 11 o'clock. So it actually looked like it was it had gone down a little bit, then it came back up. And it actually, so, so you guys were up on the day by 11. Well, it, it still was down on the day, but it started to rally and it was above the opening price. So it was looking kind of strong at 11 o'clock, even though it had, had this terrible once in a generation down day on Friday. And so I hadn't gotten my systems working on anything but bonds, fortunately. So bonds were down a lot on Friday. So I bought a lot of bonds for my personal account. We all had PAs at that point. Okay, and let, let me ask you about that because I, I just I'm gonna I'm sorry I interrupt. No, no, sure. So, but but when you say your systems, you got your systems in place. So presumably your systems were showing you. I'm just guessing. This was a statistically outlandish move on bonds. So as given history, the history of bond prices, your systems were probably showing you that it was very highly likely that bond bonds bounce when they move down so sharply because they're, they're generally a non-volatile asset. Yes, exactly right. So we had statistics that showed there was maybe a, a 63 or 68% of the time in similar situations, the bond market was going to be up by Tuesday morning. So I and the other traders had similar ideas at that point, and we all came in and bought bonds. So everything was you know, not looking so good at three o'clock because then the stock market went down. And then finally, people started to get the idea that the Fed, Greenspan, was going to come in and do something that turned out to be a complete game changer for the entire financial industry for the next 30 years. Our entire careers have been dominated by this one decision that Greenspan made, which was to come in and provide liquidity to the market by lowering the interest rate, essentially by creating more liquidity that would make it less of less likely that there'd be a you know a deflationary spiral and and instead that there'd be more money available to come and invest but what he did by doing that was actually create something that shouldn't exist according to normal modern portfolio theory and classical economics he created something that protects you when stocks go down, but also has a positive rate of return on its own. The idea that bonds are a protective asset for equity holders, because when stocks go down, bonds are safe and everybody wants them, because the idea is the Fed is going to lower interest rates and bonds will go up as a result. So in modern portfolio theory, that shouldn't exist. It should be a put which costs money to buy on the stock market. But instead, it is, is something that for 30 years was a wonderful thing to have in your portfolio to protect you. So, so yeah. So, so again, I, I don't mean to, but I just yeah. want to try to explain in a different way. So, so people can understand from every sure, angle. Yeah. So essentially what, what we're used to now is like we saw in 2008, 2009, when the markets crashed, the federal reserve comes in mm -hmm. and basically just throws money at the economy in some way or other, which you, refer, you referred to it in, in one way, but they, they come up with a mechanism for throwing money at the economy. Some of that money ends up in the stock market. And because people anticipate what's going to happen, the market starts to react almost immediately. Right. And, and now when, when, and now it's such the case that even when we hear good news about the economy, sometimes the market falls because the Federal Reserve doesn't want to hear good news. They're ready for the bad news. 
So it's so it's so built into the news cycle and how it affects the markets that one event you're referring to in 1987. Right. And, and you're saying that shouldn't really happen. There should be risk to helping an entire global market. <laughs> well, it, it's actually something slightly different. The idea is that if you have an asset that something that in your portfolio that protects you, like an insurance policy, when the stock market goes down, you should have to pay to get that insurance, just like any other type of insurance. So you can buy a put option, which will protect you, and that costs money. And it, it, over time, it can be incredibly costly to own that kind of downside protection. But suddenly, Greenspan, by that action, created a put, a protective asset for equities that actually made money. And we call those government bonds. So suddenly having stocks and bonds in your portfolio, you had two assets that were going to perform oppositely, and that shouldn't happen. They, they shouldn't both be able to make money. One should, be cost, one should cost money. The bond should cost money, but it doesn't. It pays you a rate of return. So the idea of a 60-40 portfolio, whatever the 40-60 portfolio, some people call it risk parity, or you can even lever it up. The whole world that we've lived in it rests under the assumption that stocks and bonds are going to move oppositely if there is a crisis in the stock market. But what if that's not true? It was not true in the 70s. What if we're in a world right now where stocks and bonds can go down together and not in, move in opposite directions? And that's a really interesting question. What about all these pension fund assumptions of 7.5% return required to pay out all the obligations that they've made? if suddenly you can lose money on both sides of your equity and your fixed income. Yeah. So, so essentially what started then, well, actually we'll get to the economics in a second. I still want to hear what deal with the psychology. So three o'clock, I would be jumping out of a building and, as and I recall, Victor, my brother was ready to, uh, he, he looked about as unhappy as I've ever seen anybody. Did he cry? He, uh, he was very unhappy. I, yeah, it was, a. Uh, did you cry? <laughs> I don't think I quite understood just how bad it was. Uh -huh. I, I did after I thought about it, but I, it was about my third week of trading. I, was, I had no real understanding other than, holy cow, I just wrote this program to display the S&P prices, and it, the scale just went, it just doubled and doubled and doubled about eight times because it just went down so much more than it had ever gone down before. So to me, that was like, oh my God, my program actually handled that, ex that exponential thing. It looked like a, a uh, falling off a cliff. That's actually an interesting psychology that something horrible could be happening, but if you're diversified in your life, like you also had this software pleasure that you see this working for you, that kind of buffered a little bit the misery of you know, this other disastrous thing well, happening. Uh, right. But at and the same you were time, young, so you have that I was young and completely naive. But also remember, I was only long fixed income and those started to go up by three o'clock. So I was personally having a relatively good day, even by that point. But I watched, you know, but the whole firm looked like it was going to go under. So I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know whether I was going to come in to have a job the next day. And, 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 and again, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt. Sure. But I'm assuming because Friday was such a horrible day and Victor was such a contrarian, probably the end of the day, Friday, he, his systems were saying, okay, this is stati statistically outlandish. Chances are there's going to be a bounce. So he probably loaded up on Friday, not expecting it to open up, what, 20% lower on Monday. Yeah, it, I don't think it opened that much lower on Monday. I think it, it was definitely a down open. But And then, as I said, it, it really looked like it was fairly strong at 11 o'clock. So there we are at 3 o'clock. We didn't know what was going to happen. My brother looked like death itself. And then suddenly, the bonds start to rally. And my brother also had an enormous amount of long fixed income, long bonds. And that position, the bonds had their biggest move. It was a seven-point rally. And that position bailed out his equity position. So suddenly, he had a, a pretty decent day going on. And we were all solvent. And interestingly, the money I made in that one day, I kept. Five years later, that became my working capital for the business that I started in 1992. Because, because Victor, it was not only his fund, but he was all, you were also trading your own Right. Personal. At that point, everyone had personal accounts as well to test systems. And, yeah. so, and we, we didn't really have a formal customer structure. It was just a few managed accounts. So it, was, it was not quite as organized as it became later on. So, so, so he was able to bail out of the bonds, more or less. And then just would he double down on equities at, at 3 o'clock? Like, what happened at 3 o'clock? I think, as I recall, he just kept everything. 
and yeah. stocks were tremendously tremendous loser and he got margin calls and he said oh, i can't make these margin calls but then he could because he was able to get out of his bonds the next day up seven bucks seven points so yeah because next day was a huge up day he just held everything overnight i believe he was able to hold everything because he could make the margin calls and, and how was he able to so so one thing about uh victor is of course that he he borrowed a lot to make his trades often how was he able to convince the banks not to that and the banks were panicking the banks thought american capitalism was over that day how was he able to kind of Maybe because they were just too busy with other things, but how was he able to keep the banks away from his bank account? I think you had till the next day to make the margin call. That was just the rules of the, uh, you, know, you get the call and then you have the, till the next day to, to make it. So. And, so, and by the next day, the market opened up. Yeah, I, 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 it was you know, 31 years ago, so I don't remember all the details, but that, that's how I remember it. And it was, uh, you know, it, it was a, a real scare, but one that taught me the importance of under recognizing that markets can do something that they've never done before completely out of the database and all the historical testing in the world won't help you in that situation. Yeah, because let me even ask you about your test on bonds. They had this, it's not like it's a statistical, you know, outlier. It was beyond statistical outlier. It was like an earthquake. So how can you say, well, whenever there's an earthquake, this happens next because you can't predict earthquakes. It's something it was it's a it's really a once in a lifetime event as opposed to a statistical outlier. Right. And why, the, why didn't you being a skeptic? Why didn't you think to yourself, OK, my system doesn't work for this? Well, in fact, it did for uh, for fixed income. And then interestingly, so many other big declines on Friday for the next 10 or 15 years reminded people of the market crash. So Monday became a tremendous buying opportunity because everyone would on Monday, on, after a big down Friday, everyone would think, uh-oh, there's going to be another market crash. And they'd panic sell on Monday morning, which made it a very, very good time to get long. There was only one, there was a mini crash a few years in, in 89 that, that it went down on Monday. But almost every other time, probably 90% of the time, it went up on those days. Well, I guess, um, what was it, the first Monday or the first Tuesday after the 9-11, it gapped down, had, had a little bump up by 11 a.m., but then boom, kept going down for the next four days. Well, that was another uh, another once in a lifetime moment that I remember very vividly. I don't know if you want to get into that. Yeah, but, sure. Well, that was uh, that was a, a, interestingly another day when we that we we were long. Uh, this is when I had my own company. Now we're, we're uh, now uh, 14 years later, and I was running some money for at a fund and manage accounts, and maybe 10 or 12 employees, and the stock market had been down five days in a row the previous week and then had a nice up day on Monday on September 10th. And we walked in on Tuesday morning about eight o'clock and futures were gapping up. Everything was up, right? We had a, we had about a plus 2% gain and we were about to get out of that position and we had already started selling Europe and European equities. And suddenly I was in my office. In fact, we were, I, I remember I was on the phone with an architect because we were going to move our office because we were expanding. And my head trader walks in my office and says, Roy, you're not going to believe this. A, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. And I think you should come in here and, and look at this. And even from that moment, Paul Shen, my head trader, really had the sense that this was not just what everyone thought at that moment, which is, oh, it's just some small plane that it hit. And he just had this feeling over the next 20 or 30 minutes that something really important was happening. Because the market, even after the, the first plane hit at 8.45, really it. It went down people, a little. And right, came right after the initial news, people thought it was just an accident or a small plane. So the market actually was up from that point at around 9. Right. The, the, it didn't really react so much. And, of course, at that point, Paul was a little nervous. So he said, he said you know, let's, let's start selling some more uh, DAX, the European stocks, to hedge some of our U.S. equities to try to reduce our exposure because he just didn't like it. There was something that bothered him about it. And you know, I said, yeah, absolutely, we should do that. And we had a, a, a new guy who was really not, uh, not su such an experienced trader. And he, the market was going down a little bit toward the, toward the end of that 20 minute period. And he was selling ones and twos and Paul finally just pushed him out of the way and really started hitting it because he recognized that it was, he was losing it. And the market was running away to the downside. And then, of course, the second plane hit, and he tried to get some more done, and he got a little bit off at that point, but it was all over. And of course, there was no trading. The stock, U.S. stocks never opened that day. 
were you were you um potentially panicked that week so the market closed for the week like you said were you potentially panicked that week well Your i mean firm was kind of you know we, still small but well growing. right we had a, obviously a terrible day because we were long stocks but what was the worst was that the the, the desk that we had the the closest relationship to was uh car futures who were all on the 94th floor of the mm. first tower and the, the line, we talked to them probably 10 times already that day and i can still remember their voices vividly even today on the phone and their phone went dead and that was it and we didn't know what was going on we traded with them tens of maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars that day we didn't know if those trades were good finally hours later we got a call from the home office in chicago he said roy whatever you guys know is good whatever you say you did is and it was completely on our on our word and i never forgot that that you know who on wall street would allow 100 million dollars 200 million dollars of trading at whatever prices the customer thinks they traded at and they had I, I i it's very moving to me that that's the way they approached it they didn't say oh we want to hear your tapes we want to see your records they just said if you know it it's good and and the business continued but uh that was certainly an unforgettable moment another out of database before the phone went dead what were they saying well we had just traded with them maybe half an hour before the first plane hit so okay. it wasn't really it, it was before a plane hit and then nothing after that so that, okay. there was no inter gosh so uh so you get back to trading again you they're not not only is you're dealing with the psychology of where your market position is but people you knew died there was sure. probably post traumatic stress right then how did you how did you decide as a business and as the owner of that business to to psychologically keep going like how did what was the strategy of how you would psychologically play out that next week well we were systematic traders so we we had to really make a decision how do we handle the moves? And basically what we did is we interpolated where we thought the markets were based on Europe and other, other things we could do. And we plugged those into our, our strategy. We, I think we didn't trade for about five days. And then we just came in and, and kept going. And of course, we, we talked to all of our clients and explained what had happened and how we handled this and who, where the, that we felt that everything was safe and that uh, we were going to keep going. And everyone was very supportive and, you know, but there are people that were just really close friends and trading counterparties and people that we knew from in so many of the firms that were there that was, and it's still it's such a it's it, it, i still remember them so vividly i think you know also obviously at that point um the federal reserve bailed out the market so there mm -hmm. was a little bit of that uh the greenspan put um happening underneath the market so that helped quite a bit for the next few months um you know, even though it was also the middle of the dot com bust, there was a lot of volatility, which was great for your for short term systems. You're a short term systems right. trader. Right. So, I mean, my guess is the majority of the, your systems at that time, I don't know if it's still this way, was if the market goes down at a certain speed for so many days in a row, this is probably a good time to buy the market regardless of what the market is. <laughs> well, there's, you know, there's a lot going on that we've, uh, you know, we've developed over the years. But as, essentially, the idea is that market movements will trigger cognitive biases in the participants things like the consensus bias wanting to do what everyone else around you is doing things like loss aversion when a popular position that people have suddenly loses a lot of money and it happens very fast and recently it's very painful because we all hate to lose more than we love to win this is all of course the work of daniel kahneman and so what we try to do is create rules that are based on these well-known cognitive biases that have been shown in many, many aspects of human behavior and trading. And there it all ties into my neuroscience years at Harvard, where the uh, things I learned there suddenly started to reappear in our trading strategy. So what our strategy tends to do its best in are periods of time when people are subject to these biases. So when do people really fall prey to instinctive behavior. It's when they're experiencing high levels of emotion. Typically when markets are very volatile and moving around a lot, that's when people trade instinctively and not rationally. So we've always said, well, our strategy is short term, but particularly good when there's a lot of realized volatility, when markets are moving around a lot. So like, uh, like a 2008 or 2009, 
might have been a particularly volatile right, period. Right, right. 08 was our, our, our best year ever. It was what, a, what were you up in 08? Uh, Mid 50s on, on 2 billion in starting assets. So, so it's the basic idea that let's say you wake up one day and your favorite stock is, opens up down 10%. Now you're going to panic and say, oh my gosh, it can go down 40%. So now instead of making a rational decision to sell, you're going to make an irrational decision to sell. And the idea is, is that when, when there's a lot of irrational decision making in the market, the market should be higher. Like eventually that irrational decision making will be reversed as rational players enter in. Exactly. And, so, and statistically you model that. You don't just decide that. You, you model right. when you think it's highly likely that irrational behavior is occurring. Exactly. Having strategies that have been tested across thousands of individual independent observations. And interestingly, one thing we do is we trade every market the same way. So we're testing fixed income strategies using equity data and currency data and Google and soybeans. And we trade the same systems across all of these instruments. The idea being these are universal human factors, not just something that's true about the bond market or soybeans. So what it's Work, the way it's worked out is that we've tended to, uh, to do very well when there are periods of high volatility. When are there periods of high volatility? Well, that often coincides so when the stock market is going down. That's the biggest cause of market volatility. So we also have thought of ourselves as a protective strategy that does well when equities go down, but with a positive rate of return. But that's not the bond market, which is what I described before, as another strategy that at least until recently has had that. Well, okay. when volatility is very low, how do you find opportunities? Or are you saying there's always some market where there's high volatility? Well, there's always some market, uh, usually some markets that are moving, but uh, w some of the things that we've developed uh, y years ago now, but over the course of our first few years were ways of saying, okay, well, this is not a very volatile period and markets do behave differently when they're quiet. So we want to trade it somewhat differently and use different strategies. But now... There's so many kind of, at the time when you started, there weren't that many software-based hedge funds using quantitative systems. Now there's books about it, articles about it, websites about it, hundreds of hedge funds that are quantitative. There's conferences about quantitative systems. Hasn't everybody squeezed all the juice out of these irrational, like as soon as somebody makes an irrational decision, there's probably someone on the other side taking advantage of it. Well, it's certainly harder than it used to be. And yet there are still very interesting areas of research that we're doing and we're coming up with interesting strategies even today after a quarter century of doing this. So it's still in the data. Can you say an interesting strategy? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I mean, but, I can, but we'd have to shut the mic off. <laughs> but let, let me ask you this then. Take a new asset class like crypto. What's your, what's your stance on that? So I have a lot to say about the crypto market. And Interestingly, it actually all ties into what we've been talking about. So what has been the action of the Federal Reserve? What's been the, the government response to periods when the markets need liquidity? Well, they've essentially printed money. They've created liquidity out of nowhere, um, particularly since 2008 when they began quantitative easing. So the government essentially is falling into the trap that has happened every single time a government has issued currency in human history. And some, there's a couple of fun examples. I think the, uh, the first one that's really, uh, really clear is in uh, around the turn of the first millennium, year zero. If you were gonna, you were a Roman soldier and you're gonna take your buddies out for a drink, you'd throw down a, uh, a coin called a denarius that was an ounce of almost pure silver. And you could buy a couple of drinks for your one denarius. Fast forward 240 years later under an emperor called Peter the Arab, the same Roman denarius was worth, had 0.05% silver instead of almost 100% silver. So they devalued it by 99.95%. Mm. And by the fall of the Roman empire, it was 0.02%. So they went even further. And, you know, of course, we see this in Venezuela. Literally, as we speak, it's happening. In Iran, it's happening. It was just an article in the Times. Do you think if they never did that devaluing, Roman Empire 
wouldn't have fallen the I, same way? I'm sure there's a case to be made that the devaluation of people's assets was one of the causes of the fall of the Roman Empire. I'm not a classicist, but I, uh, I certainly would make that bet given how it's happened every single time in history. So, and by the way, I'm going to come back to crypto. This is all going to lead yeah. somewhere. Don't worry. So another, another little fact I, I love to talk about is that if you were going to go on a date in 1900 in New York City, you would take your girlfriend to an oyster bar. You've probably been to the oyster bar in Grand Central Station. That's one of the remnant few, but there used to be hundreds of them. And every one of them for five cents, you got all the oysters you could eat. And they were big oysters, the size of a dinner plate and all the beer you could drink. Fantastic deal for five cents. If you could find that today, it might be $100 or something. So again, 120 years, devalued. The dollars in oyster terms is down 99.95%. And you know, I remember I was in Zimbabwe in, 2000, in uh, 2007, and I got $100 trillion bills as change for my lunch. Were you vacationing? Yeah, I was on a safari <laughs> at the end of it. But anyway, the, 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 the vice of governments is to print money. And I believe we've made in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid about $120 billion worth, I'm sorry, $120 trillion worth of promises to our people that we don't have. So I believe the U.S. government is going to print money to, do, to meet those obligations. And so... When I heard about Bitcoin back in 2011, I remember exactly where I was. It was like I was hit by a bolt of lightning. I was sitting at my kitchen island. And I opened the copy of Wired magazine. There's an article called The Rise and Fall of Bitcoin. It had gone to $20 and back to three at that point. And I read about this thing that was kind of money that had a fixed supply. And I said, wow, this is the solution to the great vice of fiat currencies and even asset-backed currencies like the denarius in Rome. Governments always reduce the value, except if the supply is fixed. And supply here, you're saying, has to be fixed because the software and exactly. software we've never, seen for a decade. Exactly. 21 million, that's it. No more Bitcoin. So I bought early and I have been a tremendous proponent of, uh, of Bitcoin since. And I think there's something very special about cryptocurrency. Now, I love blockchain too, and I think that's a revolution in itself. But cryptocurrency has a very specific quality. If you think back to the oysters, what would have happened if you kept your money in oysters? Well, if you remember, Indians used to keep wampum. That was literally oyster shells. So they had some inkling of it having a fixed value. What about if you kept your money in gold from 1900? you'd basically have the same amount as you had in 1900, right? They, they say for 2,000 years, gold has purchased one, a, a good suit of clothing. And that's basically the case for the last 120 years. But if you'd invested in the stock market in 1900, you'd be richer than Warren Buffett. So how do I reconcile these two things? I'm talking about a fixed supply asset like gold, and oysters, or like Bitcoin as a good investment, yet you would have done much better to be in dollar fiat currency, even with the 99.95% devaluation, you're still the, one of the richest people in the world. The difference and the reason that Bitcoin is different from any other fixed supply as money that's ever been created is that it has associated with it a financial ecosystem as robust and powerful as a fiat currency. So you can buy stocks with Bitcoin. We call those ICOs. You can lend Bitcoin. You can lend at 9 or 11%, and there's a forward rate, just there's a yield curve. You can trade futures. Soon there'll be a full-fledged derivatives market, an options market. Could you argue gold was always like that, though? I'm not sure. so sure. I think for most people, if you have ingots, you, uh, you're kind of stuck with, uh, sitting on them with your shotgun or keeping them in a vault. And, of course, transporting them, you know, if you, if you do the math, a suitcase worth of gold is about a million dollars. But if you've got $10, $10 million to transfer, they're not going to let you on a plane. So you're right. kind of stuck. And so Bitcoin has this fungibility aspect where you could send it from place to place for almost nothing these days in almost zero time, you know, a few tens of minutes. Do you ever get worried that, you know, blockchain as a technology is being used, is starting to be used by almost every bank, Walmart, UPS, even the central bank is, you know, Federal Reserve Bank is looking at uses of blockchain. 
they ever get worried about that the underlying technology could be separated from uh, the use of blockchain as money, which is called Bitcoin? I, I do. I think the digital currency is different from cryptocurrency. I think a U.S. dollar linked cryptocurrency would be an interesting policy tool because it would enable z negative interest rates. So if you think about the problem of the government wanting to simulate the economy by having not 0% interest, but negative rates of interest, where if you put your money in the bank, they give you 1% or 2% less every year. Well, people would say, well, why do I put my money in a bank? I'll just keep my cash in my safe and I'll just sit on it. I'm not going to earn minus 1%. I'd rather earn zero just by having it in my safe. Well, if all your money is in cryptocurrency, they can actually just take it away from you. So having a US dollar or reserve currency that's in a, in a, digital, as, a digital currency format allows central banks and, and the government to do that. So there may be a reason that they have it. The problem is they're still subject to the same vice of all governments, which is making too many of these negative interest rate secure dollar bit dollars or whatever one would call them. So it becomes very dangerous to hold them because they can just make as many as they want. Bitcoin and the other major cryptocurrencies are algorithmically not going to be uh, there. There will be no more extra supply. But the reason often the Federal Reserve devalues or the government in general has been in favor of devaluing is to, like you say, pay for obligations that they made in the past, whether it was Nixon trying to pay for the Vietnam War or, you know, the, the bailout with Bernanke and, and, and government officials then. So, so how would you manage monetary policy with a central bank linked to cryptocurrency? Well, that's a very interesting question. How would a government behave if it had to behave like any other business? And the answer is they probably would spend a lot less money and make a lot less promises. And it would probably change who people vote for. It would be, a, to me, and again, what interested me in the beginning was, wow, this is really a, a, a different way of thinking about money and government. So I think the world would be a very different place and do you it might think, be do a th better place. Do you think the government, I mean, governments in general, countries in general have a tendency almost to, to trend negatively. Like the Roman Empire was around forever, but ultimately they trended in the direction of their money. And I think every country throughout history has done that. Do you think there is a way for them to say, oh, let's look at this new type of monetary policy, spend less money, which is different than we've ever done in every year of American history. Do you think that mindset is possible? I think in a democracy, it may not be possible because it would be very easy to vote for people that are going to make promises that are easy, more easily understood. Like, don't worry, we're going to make good on, on all this obligation that we told you we would do. And the person saying, no, no, there's not enough money to do that is not going to, it's, no one likes a negative candidate. So I think there's probably a structural reason why we will never have that in the United States or in, in any democracy. It's too painful. So, so. Uh, what's your, you know, are you guys investing in it? Are you looking at patterns in big crypto the same way you looked in patterns in other systems? So interestingly, we have done a lot of work in, a, in, in many different facets of crypto, ranging from mining and arbitrage and HFT, position trading, ICOs. And then we have our existing models, which have never seen a cryptocurrency. And we found something very interesting that our existing models work, that the same cognitive biases that people have when they trade soybeans and Google and U.S. Treasury bonds are present in the way people trade crypto. And where, where just as a final thing, where, what, should pe what books could people read to learn more about these cognitive biases that, that you've been modeling? So I, I have two books that I, I love to recommend and give to people. Um, one is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And in it, he really goes, I think it's the greatest book on trading. It doesn't have much to do with trading until you start thinking about it, about it as a metaphor for trading. And then every single page has something to do with trading and living more effectively as well. So I'd recommend that. And uh, another book that I love, which interestingly was written by another Harvard neuroscientist. He, he preceded me in the lab I was in, which was run by a guy named Steve Koslin. Uh, the, the most famous grad student when I was there in the 80s was this guy named Steven Pinker. 
and uh, enlightenment sure. now is, exactly. is most recent. Exactly. So even back then, Pinker was a superstar and, uh, He's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And his book, uh, The Blank Slate, also has some very interesting ideas that I think are uh, worth thinking about and counter consensus. So final, final thing. And I really appreciate uh, after all these years of knowing you, you and your brother, uh, you coming on the podcast, you, your hedge funds obviously has done very well. You've been in the finance space for, for 30 years. Uh, you're obviously a genius, even though you might not admit it because you're self-deprecating, but how has money changed your lifestyle? <laughs> like, do you, do you live large? <laughs> well, I, I don't think most people would say that I, I'm extravagant, but it certainly allowed me to pr have a lot of fun and pursue a lot of interests and most important, do some good for the world, I think, in a way that will probably outlast my hedge fund, I think uh, maybe the New York City Opera coming back from bankruptcy that I was able to help happen or uh, some of the charitable work that I've done for kids studying music and something called the Harmony Program, where we give uh, 10 hours a week of instrumental music education to kids that have no access to music. Those are more lasting things. So it's, cert it's certainly been a, you know, nothing that I could have done with my two hands, you know, being in the Peace Corps. But by being a reasonably successful guy in the finance world, I've been able to maybe change some other lives in, in a more, uh, more significant way that I could have and make some art that hopefully will survive longer, long after I do. Oh, Roy, that's, that, that's, that's very important because I think people often think money is reverse correlated with uh, being, doing good in the world. Um, actually, I do have a final question, which is where do you think the world's heading? Where do you think the market's heading in the next year or two? <laughs> Well, should people uh, be optimistic like your brother's optimistic? So I'm, I'm not going to opine on, on regular financial markets, but I am going to opine on Bitcoin. So I, I, have, to, I have to say that one of, my, one of my more interesting ideas was lately was that, I think, was that when you run a futures fund, most of your money just sits in the bank doing nothing. And you're only using a little bit of it at the exchange to trade. And the rest of it is in the bank. So I said to myself, well, what about if that would be crypto? instead of dollars. So I believe that the great reason to own and be bullish on cryptocurrencies is that you have the ability to do things besides just own cryptocurrencies. You can lend it, you can invest in a hedge fund that keeps you that exposure, long exposure, but does something else with it. In our case, run a futures fund on top of it. You can lend it. So I think this is a revolution that's happening. Crypto is, uh, Bitcoin is, say, at 6,300. I think there's a real possibility that crypto goes up by a factor of 200 to 300 from here and has the same size and uh, market cap as a fiat reserve currency like dollar yen or, or like the yen or like the euro. So we have a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. I might be right about this. I'm likely wrong. I'm probably, this is probably a one in three or one in five possibility. There are a lot of things that can go wrong, but if I'm right, there are very few things that have the chance to go 200 X rather quickly enough to make a difference that are liquid enough and that you can earn a return having them along the way. So even putting a small amount of your cash into crypto gives you that optionality for a two, 300 X return on it. I believe so. And, and people say, oh, it's too volatile. And, uh, it doesn't matter if you're only putting 1% of your portfolio exactly. or 2% of your portfolio into it. And, and also, th that's why the opportunity is what it is. It's, it's hard to invest in because it's so volatile, but that's why it's not worth 10 times as much as it is. It's hard to invest in because it's cumbersome, and, and, it, and it's cumbersome, and maybe you're afraid it's going to get hacked. That's why it's not up another 10x. And all these reasons not to invest are reasons why the price is as low as it is right now. But all those things are fixable problems. Right. People are working on every single one of those issues. Right. I, I, I have to just say one more thing about speculators and volatility. A lot of people over the last couple of decades have talked about how speculators are the cause of volatility. And the funny thing is everyone knows a story of how speculators reduce volatility. But you didn't learn it in an economics textbook. You learned it in Sunday school or at a, a Torah study. It's a story of Joseph in the Bible. So Joseph was the first speculator. What did he do? He had a great tip. Grain was going to be scarce. So 
you should store it up for seven years. So what did he do? He bought it for seven years, raised the price, obviously, at that point by buying a lot of it. Then he sold it out when there was a drought for seven years, reduced the price. So the price was less volatile as a result of Joseph's trading. So he reduced the vol of grain. And I believe that that's what speculators do. And as there's more speculation, as all these derivative markets are coming, options market, futures markets, the volatility of crypto is going to drop tremendously, just as it's done in every other security and stocks and bonds and commodities right. as speculators come in. So again, this is another reason why it's so scary right now to buy it. That's why the price is so low and that's why the opportunity is as low as it is. And it's interesting, like Joseph Stiglitz just commented, you know, Nobel Prize winner in economics, that, mm -hmm. that regulation will be the death of crypto. But you're essentially saying the opposite, that, that regulation is going to allow people to create derivatives markets, options markets, and then ultimately reduce the volatility of Bitcoin, which will cause it to go up. Exactly. I, I think at this point, the markets are, the, the regulations are coming. There's a lot of really smart people who are thinking about how these regulations are going to look. They're working groups at every one of the regulatory authorities. They're smart. They get it. And they recognize that this is not going away. Blockchain's not going away. And it's not the kind of thing that there's going to be a blanket ban. And the idea of the, the most public ledger in the world, the most transparent thing, the Bitcoin blockchain could somehow be an, a source of illegal activity. The last place a criminal is going to put their assets is on the most public blockchain in the world where it's distributed and everybody can see it. So to me, it's actually the safest place and the least likely place to have criminal activity. And all of the hacks and all of the exchange problems that people have had, this is what Taleb calls anti-fragility. He has this idea that the more something is challenged, if it's anti-fragile, it gets stronger. And that's what's happening with every cryptocurrency. Every hack makes it stronger in a year. It's going to be 10 times as strong and 100 times as strong. So this is a, a fantastic rate of improvement that will lead to a beautiful new asset class, I believe, with enormous potential. Well, Roy Niederhofer, hedge fund manager, super investor, philanthropist, Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I hope you come on again. I feel like there's a, a billion things we can talk about. So, so uh, I look forward to the next time. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Ray. Great to see you again. Hey, thank you for listening to my show on YouTube today. I have a really special brand new episode coming out next week. But you can watch it early. Just click on the link right here or subscribe to the channel when you click on my face. And one more thing. Don't forget to click the bell. I'll see you next time.